I'm Indy Nidell, Jedi. I'm Indy Nidell, Space Knight. I can say that, right? I'm allowed to say that, yeah? And this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here with my lights, my laser saber, yeah? and answer all of your questions about Star Wars and the First World War. Oh, okay. I can't say that. And I, I can answer their questions about Star Wars. You can answer questions about it, right? I'm not claiming I'm part of it. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, Tony, St Tony Steller, right? Tony Steller is our, our cameraman today. All right, hi Tony. Hey. Hey, okay, <laughs> what are you writing? Tony Steller writes, uh, hi Indy, a question for Out of the Trenches. All right. Um, how come Jedi Knights don't always cut off body parts of them on their own bodies with their lightsabers. It seems self-evident that just swinging it around, you would accidentally cut off some fingers or legs. Please help. Okay, um, well, Tony, that's a very good question. Um, now, bear in mind, this all happened a long, long time ago. And there's a galaxy far, far away, so there's not so much information available. Um, but what we have says that yes, uh, the Jedi Knights, particularly the Padawans, those training to be Jedi Knights, did in fact cut off many of their own body parts. When you think of it, this sword, which is not a lightsaber, but it's similar to a lightsaber, um, it's not like a regular sword. A regular sword, you can you know, tap on your hand like that, or you can put it down, you might like use clean dirt off your shoe or something like that. Or even if you swing around a regular sword, get a regular sword, swing it around, talk to your friend, you're going to touch some of your body parts at some point with your regular sword. You can't do that with one of these because then you would in fact cut them off. Now, they did have very, very excellent prosthetic technology. Uh, Luke Skywalker, for example, had that, you know, had his extra hand made and that had feeling and everything. So I would imagine that as long as you were fairly close to a medical bay, it wouldn't be that big a problem to get a new foot or new fingers or something like that. If you were on Tatooine, that might be a much bigger problem because of the lack of modern medical services. Now, there was a Jedi Knight on the Jedi Council. You remember that one with a gigantic neck that's about as long as this, as this uh, sword? That's a magnet for a lightsaber right there. That's a really unfortunate Jedi. If I was that kid, I wouldn't like look at lightsabers and think, man, that's what I want to fight against when I grow up. Okay, anyhow, um, I'm gonna put my lights, my laser saber away and answer some more questions. What do you got for me? Um, Striker 345-ify. Okay. Hi, Indy. A question for Out of the Trenches. Can you explain the role that British Malaya had during the war, particularly the resources Malaya gave for the war effort and the amount of men sent to fight for the British? Okay. Um, British Malaya, which was an only recently centralized set of territories owned by Great Britain on the Malayan Peninsula and the island of Singapore, was the main provider of rubber and tin for the British war economy. Uh, after the invention of the vulcanization process, rubber became incredibly useful for industry and the overall economy before and during the Great War. For waterproof clothing, gas masks, medical gloves, tires, uh, insulators for cables, and, well, you can think many, many other things. Uh, like in the manufacture of ships and submarines, you needed it. The natural resources of the region were extremely important for the British war effort. Now, Germany's East Asia, East Asia squadron knew this, of course, but did not have the power, did not have the manpower or ship power to attack the supply lines head on and chose to withdraw their forces, except for, well, a little pirate ship that we've already talked about. And the journey, uh, that journey of the light cruiser Emden, uh, which you have to check out if you haven't, showed how vulnerable the supply line actually was. Uh, in October 1914, the Emden appeared in the harbor of Penang and wreaked havoc on the surprised ships there, torpedoing the Russian cruiser Zemshug. Uh, the Emden's captain, Mueller, aimed to undermine British authority with the locals, right? And Britain was more afraid of that than anything, since the authority over Malaya gave Britain a say in the colonial power politics of the region. And its biggest competitors were the U.S. and especially Japan, to whom the Great War had already given the control of the German, uh, German possessions in the region. So economic tensions ran high. 
A bad rash, says. Question for out of the trenches, okay? Since America is slowly showing up, Pershing is organizing training, but you'd mentioned the artillery was not with the gun crews, which makes me think, did Pershing have to requisition British and French equipment for training? Is that why Americans also adopted the British helmets, uniforms of the war? This series is something I've been wanting since I watched Ken Burns' Civil War documentary. I hope I get to see another major war covered in similar fashion by this wonderful and dedicated crew. All right, much love. He gave us much love, you wonderful and dedicated crew. Okay, um, well, we'll probably cover the American uniforms in more detail in a special episode in future, since we've done that for several other countries. Uh, but this is a quick rundown, okay? Uh, U.S. troops arrived in France with their own uniforms, a khaki-colored standard uniform they had introduced in 1903, and their own small arms, the standard infantry rifle uh, M1903 Springfield, and small arms from American gunmakers like Smith & Wesson, Colt, Remington, and Browning. Uh, and the new model, the M1917 Browning machine gun that had only recently been introduced. But, like with pretty much everything except men, and morale, the U.S. Army lacked the sufficient numbers to outfit hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and much of its available equipment was outdated. Um, in the Spanish-American War, or the border expedition against Mexico, it was sufficient to give a man a uniform, a rifle, and some basic equipment. But not so anymore in 1917 in Europe, oh no, um, since they lacked pretty much all modern fighting equipment and could not simply wait until the American industry caught up, the Allies began training and outfitting the American troops with their own equipment and weapons. Most soldiers were given the Brody helmet, except for most of the African-American combat troops who wore the French Adrian helmet. Um, men were trained in using rifles like the Enfield and the LaBelle and the Allied machine guns. The lucky ones got their hands on a Lewis gun, the less lucky ones on a show shot. Um, they were given the newest gas masks and trench equipment, the artillery of the AEF, the American Expeditionary Force. While their own 1903 field gun was adequate, preferred using the proven models like the French 75 or the British 8-inch howitzers. They also began training in the Renault FT tank since the U.S. had no tank program except for the Mark 8 Liberty project later down the line. And the American pilots flew French and British aircraft. Uh, their own Curtis models were only used as training planes back at home. So yes is my answer to you. It was vital for the AEF to be equipped with allied weapons. Otherwise, they would not have been able to make an impact for uh, much more time. Uh, Thel Fifi writes, Hey there, great show. Thank you, Thel Fifi. I have been a fan for a long while now, and I thought I would finally ask a question for Out of the Trenches. I read in Ernst Jünger's Storm of Steel that the frontline troops would often booby-trap positions that they would surrender to the enemy. For example, when they fell back to the Hindenburg Line, many of the German soldiers would lay traps for the Allies. To signal that they did this, they would leave a wire cutter on display for the enemy, for example, on a table. A gentleman's warning or some macabre humor, I'm not sure. Can you, me, confirm or deny this? Great show, looking forward to an episode every week. Cheers from Denmark. All right, Denmark. Um, the concept of using traps to hurt your enemy, well, was well known to all sides of the war. Uh, barbed wire is basically a booby trap in itself, as were spikes and, you know, steel caltrops that people would throw on the ground for men and horses to trip on. Um, all sides experimented with explosive traps quite early on, despite the honorable war everyone claimed to be fighting. Uh, for example, the Germans invented a mechanical fuse lighter for landmines in 1914 that pretty much every other nation copied as quickly as possible. The reason why um, mines weren't commonly used is that they were clumsy and they simply were not that effective on a strategic level. On a more tactical level, smaller booby traps were useful in delaying the enemy and destroying morale. As the war progressed and it became more evident that Every method of killing as many men of the other side as possible was fair game. There were more experiments with lethal booby traps, okay? Um, the Germans would leave dummies of soldiers in no man's land. and uh, British raiding parties would trip uh, the positions they attacked with timed explosives, right? Wires could be attached to the safety pins of a Mills grenade or of a German stick grenade could be modified uh, with an instant fuse. 
Retreating troops prepared their whole trench systems with traps. Um, the retreat to the Hindenburg lines that you mentioned occurred in March 1917, and the Germans pretty much scorched the earth and left nothing of value for the Allies. They tore down buildings and dugouts, they dug up streets and railroads, they blocked roads, and yes, they even bombed and mined their own former positions. They even deported local able-bodied men to work in their own war industry. Uh, before I give you some examples, we have to say that there are a lot of rumors circulating about this, and you still can't really separate the traps that really existed from the ones that were fabricated by those rumors. There were tales from of simple tripwire emplacements that triggered explosives or grenades, uh, mines that were hidden under the streets, bombs with acid time triggers and cellars that would explode after a few days when the Allies had occupied them, poisoned wells, uh, a lot of smaller explosive traps in common things like, like, like lamps or gramophones, like, like uh, a new shovel sticking out of the ground, and when a careless soldier tried to pick it up, it would trigger a grenade. Or typical German souvenirs that were tacked onto explosives. Um, the, reports speak, the reports of that speak little of casualties, but of a lot of hatred towards the Germans after that experience. Um, okay, well, that is all for today. And we only had one Star Wars question, which is interesting. So, but any other Out of the Trenches questions and Star Wars questions, you know where to write them. Uh, and if you'd like to see our special episode about that little pirate ship, the Emden, which is really good, it was our Christmas special a couple years ago, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. See you soon.